Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome back to our show, your platform. I am your boy, Drew. We are Option 4 Podcast. I'm always joined by the second half of the show. GQ Nesto, how are you doing today? What it do, what it do. I'm doing great, doing great. You're doing great? Doing are you great. excited for this wonderful yeah, topic yeah. we're about to talk about? We're we going to do a shortcut, so yeah, that's, yeah. that's good. <laughs> Alt-control delete in, in some way, shape, or form, right? Hell yeah. That's what you consider? Well, ladies and gentlemen, our, our guest today, I would say, represents uh, that undeniable change. Uh, what some people may uh, view as a replacement, others may review as progress. Um, our guest today is uh, the professor at uh, USC Marshall. And uh, to talk about uh, artificial intelligence, what I think is something that we, we need to really tackle and try to develop an understanding. But uh, no further ado, welcome to our show, Mr. Milan Merrick. Am I pronouncing that? Mer- Merrick, yeah, right? yeah, that's good. Uh, right. Milan Merrick, yeah. Um, thank you for having me. Excited to talk about it. Uh, excited to have this conversation. All right. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, it was nice. Had a nice drive in. Nice sunny morning after a while of... Uh, you know, cloudy days here in LA, yeah. so it's been nice. Most definitely, you have some. You have some breakfast because you know your day's not right if you're not having breakfast. No, I had a, I had a good breakfast for you. Had a good breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So, give us a. Um, I, I know you're a professor. I've done research on you. Uh, can you give us a little bit of background about yourself to the listeners and viewers? Who is Professor Milan? Yeah, so I'm a I'm a professor at the University of Southern California, Marshall School of Business. Um, and so, being a business school professor, I spent a lot of time thinking about kind of you know, both things that are affecting companies, but also things that are affecting societies, because those tend to go hand in hand. Um, and my area in particular thinks about technology and how that impacts the world. And so um, an area where I've been doing research recently has been in things like artificial intelligence and how that's impacting what we're doing, uh, both in terms of how we work, some of how we live, um, but also what that means for companies, what that means for industry, what that means for the world when we go out there. Okay. And were, were the sciences something that even as a child, as an adolescent, you were interested in? How did you, how did you fall into where you are today? Yeah. So my, I mean, in my background, I studied engineering and then I moved into this space. And so, you know, I, I did a bit of that. I think I, I started somehow closer to sciences or at least um, kind of more like thinking about how things work. Um, but I think what got me excited more was understanding that there's a whole bunch of things that kind of outside of that that determine what ends up happening. So um, my favorite example that I always give to my class is I ask them at some point, like, when did you think electric cars were going to be a thing, right? And so they're like, oh, yeah, 2016, 2017, whatever, right now, five years from now. Um, And then I show them this video of, you know, these cars from the 1920s, which were fully electric, driving around New York City. New York City had electric taxi cabs. Um, Some of these cars still exist. There's a video on YouTube of Jay Leno zipping around L.A. in his, like, 100-year-old electric car, right? And so in some sense, we had electric cars, but there was a bunch of reasons why they didn't become a thing. And like that process around, I found more interesting, which isn't so much sciences, or it is, let's say it's not, it's not hard sciences, but it also interacts then with more of these social sciences about like why things happen the way they do. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. So let's, let's just get right to it. The question everybody probably wants to know is Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Is that possible? What's the probability of, of AI, robots, one of taking over humanity is that even something that's even realistic so i don't i mean i don't know what the probability would be i don't think it's necessarily realistic but i also don't think any of the stuff that people are talking about has moved us closer to that right the stuff that we're seeing is stuff that like has made our lives or will make our lives easier maybe maybe it's going to affect some people's jobs i don't think it has anything to do with like you know schwarzenegger walking around (laughs) (laughs) now you also like you like um speaking to you i know you uh you work kind of on both sides of the house you Mm -hmm. know with the development and and like the consultation portion uh can you explain a little bit about your experience in the development side yeah so i um i mean i do research within this space but i also started using a lot of these tools in my daily kind of work in my daily research so i spend a lot of time coding for some of the stuff that i'm doing um and i think through that, I got to see some of these things as they were kind of being built, and some, and let's say, some of the things that these artificial te- uh, artificial intelligence technologies could do before they got popular, right? So, seeing you know, kind of how some of these tools would actually be used, rather than us like now we have a super easy to use tool, but when you had to put the pieces together a few years ago, it was actually interesting to see how those pieces work because they would show you like, oh, here's where we're actually going to make a lot of progress, and here's where we're not, and that's why I don't think. 
that you know something like Terminator is realistic because I don't think we've moved in that direction. I don't think we have a, a robot that can reason or do any of that. I think we just have something that's gonna you know make a bunch of things that used to take a lot of time take a lot less time. Okay, most people I would say um, when you think of artificial, when I think of artificial intelligence, I think of of less effort I have to do in accomplishing something that I want to do. Um, but as it relates to the workforce, what is your opinion on, like, at least where I work now, like, we're super heavy in artificial intelligence. I do a lot of contract writing um, and, and outside of podcasting. So what is your opinion on it? it, is, it is, obviously, it's beneficial, but a lot of people are afraid that they're going to lose their jobs and stuff like that. What, what's your take? So, I mean, I think, I think what you're saying is really true. There's a lot of people that are kind of, I think most of the narrative is people being scared of it taking their jobs, right? I think, you know, people use it, but I think that's always the fear, and that's like the majority of the conversation. Um, I tend to be on the side of, like, I think that will, you know, it may substitute some tasks, but I don't think that necessarily means that people are going to lose their jobs as much as maybe shift to doing other tasks, maybe more interesting tasks. Um, but I think it's going to make a lot of make life a lot easier. I think, you know, in something like contract writing, where a lot of it is just dull, repetitive tasks, yeah. it's going to take a lot of that part out, which means you can do more contracts, right? Right. It can also help you with reading contracts. It can help go through the dull stuff that's just boilerplate and find the stuff that you should really focus on. So that makes your time more valuable. You can go through more contracts, which means you can get more stuff done, which means, you know, more things can get done. And so in some sense, um, I think it will change the nature of the thing that you would do, but I don't think it would necessarily completely replace you, right? Um, now you could say, and I'm happy to talk about it, you could say that there are certain things like certain you know, roles that used to take, a lot of people used to do them, and there just aren't that many of them anymore, right? So if you think in the past, like there used to be a lot of bank tellers, right? If you go to a bank, there'd be like 12 right. you know, teller stations, um, and now there are like two and a bunch of ATMs. Right. And so like though, you know, how many of those jobs exist and things like that or shit. But I don't think it's this kind of drastic. Um, everybody's going to lose their jobs. I think what we'll have more of is us finding this, finding ways to do our jobs better with this. And then also kind of being open to using it to find new ways to do stuff. Right. But in that in that transition time, like, don't you or do what do you feel that like, OK, so if I'm eliminating jobs, and then, but we're also pushing society to rely more heavily on the tech itself, mm -hmm. right? So while we're relying more heavily on the tech, there's still someone that's out of a job. So it's almost as if, hey, you better like start learning how to code or do something different because those simple tasks, those simple like type jobs won't be in existence, you know, in the future. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that that's, so I think that's what I'm saying. Like, I think there's always a, so I think that the fear of this being an issue is more kind of like fear, but I think that it, if we don't do anything about it, that can happen, right? So I think there's always a risk to say that, look, you know, people could end up losing their jobs. You could end up pushing people aside. But I think that there's, you know, sometimes that process is really slow. Um, Sometimes I don't think it's necessary that people get replaced as much as like the nature of what they do would change. So they'll shift their, you know, effort to doing something, let's say that requires more um, either interactions or more going out and doing stuff that the, that, you know, something like AI can do, right? Um, so I think that transition will happen. Um, I think my point is more that rather than being necessarily maybe afraid of like, oh, this is gonna happen, is it a bad thing? Because it's probably gonna happen thinking about like, okay, well, how can we actually adapt to this in a proactive way? Right? What's your thoughts on the privacy aspect of it? So, okay, so I think that privacy is in some sense um, overblown in the following way. We've figured out how to deal with privacy in other parts of technology, right? So if I'm a company, I can, right right now, I'm, it's scary because I'm gonna go take my stuff and I'll put it into ChatGPT and now they have my stuff, right? And that's like a privacy risk. But there's nothing preventing a company from coming in and saying, hey, we're gonna do medical records and we're gonna do this for medical records or we're gonna do this for contracts. But instead of having everybody's contracts, what we're gonna do is we're gonna provide you with the software, we're gonna provide you with some privacy secure software, and then you're gonna be able to use it in your company and you're gonna be able to use it in your medical practice, you're gonna be able to use it in your education thing and it's not gonna violate privacy. So I think there's like a solution to that. It's just that 
people need to say, no, this is important, we value privacy, therefore we're willing to pay more for privacy and therefore we get it. But I think it can happen. Like, I don't think it's, oh, it's either AI or privacy. I think there's like a privacy, you know, uh, a, a, a version. Yeah, yeah, feature, yeah exactly. Like there's a privacy feature of this that I think is actually very valuable. Um, now, now we talked about the development side. So on a, as far as when you're going out to organizations and trying to encourage them, how are those conversations like? Is it you know di- you know dinosaurs having a conversation with people of today? Like, what is uh, any challenges that you've been met with? So I've actually been quite impressed by how receptive people are to this, right? I think this is what I meant like before when I was working on stuff, when I was telling people about some of these. Um, so I think um, just one of what I think are the coolest companies and kind of startups in this space. And I think one of the coolest things about this is a company called Hugging Face, which is like, it's apparently called, an, there's an emoji called a Hugging Face. And if you look at it, their logo is this emoji. So what they do is they have, um, they're kind of like an online place where you can save your kind of AI machine learning model, right? And then you can go use it. And even, um, you know, you can log in and kind of like test it out and see how it's working and see how these things are working, right? And so that was something that I was interacting with like a year ago, two years ago, and people were like, okay, interesting, but I don't really see the point, right? They're like, I'm like, okay, look, you can take this whole thing and there's like a pre-existing model that somebody's trained that you can use now to solve your legal problem and to do everything. And I think that was like a more difficult conversation. In the past couple of months with the way this stuff has rolled out, it seems like everybody's starting to use it. It almost seems like people were using it privately and then like they found out that everybody was using it and they're like, okay. Oh, it's cool, it's music. cool now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So like, I think somehow it led to like co- completely the opposite model, right? Like I think a year ago people were like, wait, why would we do this? This sounds stupid. Versus now it's actually, they're like, oh yeah, everybody's doing it. Why aren't we doing it? Right? So I think now that, it, at least in my opinion, I think the conversation is much more pro these technologies than I had kind of anticipated. I would have anticipated much more pushback. What do you think is the missing factor from like obviously uh, as humans and AI? I mean, what's what, what's really the difference in, in a sense because they can both perform at the same level, right? So what do you think is? Um, I think it's the nature of the things that it can do. So it can do some things really well. It can't do everything well, right? And I think that that's- Such sort of as, like, what do you think? What do I think it does well? No, what, what, well, both. Let's do both. Okay, so I think a lot of like helping you find. Um, so I think if you if you have a predictable way of like solving a problem, it can help you get to that faster. If you need to produce text that looks a certain way, right? Think about news articles. Like, how many times you read a news article or you read things that like pop up on your phone and they all sound generic, right? Like, I'm assuming most of it. A lot of it is like not original. And so, you know, if I was the people writing that, I'd be very afraid that like AI is going to take my job because it replaces that, right? Um, But if you were, you know, sitting and trying to come up with like, you know, some novel perspective or you were trying to generate something new, I don't think it could necessarily do that. It could help you write it. It could help you write a book faster. It could help you express it faster. It could help you proofread faster. But I don't think it's going to give you necessarily a new idea, right? Does that make sense? Right, it, could, right. it, could, it could repeat existing ideas. It could give you a bunch of ideas to start with. It could but like- it doesn't have a touch, right? Exactly, it doesn't have that touch of like a human to say, hey, this is the thing that I want, right? And I think that's where some of these things actually get interesting. That's why I think it's like not necessarily, um, you know, I like, for instance, if you were, um, if you were thinking about like, okay, it can make music, it can make art, fine. But I don't think necessarily we'll go and put the art on our walls. We might still want, you know, artists or something like that but they might use this for inspiration it might give them different ideas that then they go take that and they generate something with it right and so i think of it as more like i think it's useful for generating ideas generating inputs it's definitely useful for getting you know things like news articles or if you had legal documents a lot of which are boilerplate right so a lot of the legal document is important but a lot of it is also standard helps right. you generate the standard stuff you can focus on the important stuff if you're trying to write a book you know maybe it helps you proofread maybe it helps you figure out how to write in a particular style how to you know make things make things more you know so it helps you do things that used to take a lot of time but i think there's still an element that you need a person to come in and say hey this is what i want but what if we're self-centered as humans what do you mean like what if we're just full of shit right and and like because obviously there's not enough like history behind this obviously this is something developing but what if what if there's something that what it's creating is creating the simplicity 
that us as humans that we don't really we sometimes overlook due to whether it could be emotions or it could be some other different x factors that can make a difference in your decision right so oh, if, yeah, yeah. You no, know, no, i think that this is the stuff that it can do well right so it can help you find things that we might have overlooked it can help you find maybe new solutions um it can also like as you said I don't treat that as a separate point, but the idea that like humans are often full of shit. And that's what I mean with the news article, right? Like you sometimes have like really bad news articles. That people are just writing and producing whatever because they want you to read it. Um, and so that I think a, a machine could automate very easily and things like that, right? But like you would imagine that there's really good content that you want somebody to create and that's what you're going to value and the machine can't do that. So, In a sense, it's almost like your job security is like, you know those jobs where you be like, do you actually get paid to do that? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? In a sense, <laughs> it, it makes you think like, dude, I need to go back to the drawing board and actually start caring again, you know? Yeah. Um, correct me and, and let's talk about this as far as uh, the intelligence actually teaching itself. And mm -hmm. I think of it almost as if a, a, a virus in a sense, you know, you create the vaccination, but eventually the virus mutates, you know what I'm saying? And now you have mm -hmm. something new. Um, is it possible or does AI actually learn on its own and adapt? I mean, I think the way that it learns, so I'll give you the best example of a, that I, I can think of, which is like a self-driving car, which is the fact that you have a way for it to teach itself, which means that you used to have to kind of teach it how to drive, which was really hard. Um, and now you can kind of put some boundaries and get it to kind of teach itself how to drive. and that ends up working better than whatever we could have done manually, right? I think that's like where this that technology has gone. Um, so then there's this idea of like, okay, can it go out and come up with some crazy thing? And so circling back to the Terminator, can we get these like crazy scenarios? Um, I mean, I think to get a crazy scenario, one, you so for a car to drive, it needs to like start, stop, go left, go right. Like that's, right? So th those are, like it makes four decisions. Right, it's complex, but it makes four decisions, and it's already like pretty complex that it's making those four decisions. To think about all of these other things, you have to like. Now it's not gonna take. You know what I mean? It takes me more. I make more decisions with driving this, drinking this beer than I do when like <laughs> driving a car. Right, so it's like it's a more complex process. You're talking about something that's like so complex that I think it's unlikely, and it wouldn't do a necessarily good job if you tried to get it to do something like that. Right, so most of the time it's even though it has lots of potential, it's focused on relatively simple tasks that are like proofreading, that are like, so all these things that Simplicity. we're using. Exactly, right? All these things that we're using to generate, um, you know, you wanna, you wanna get it to kind of write a document for you, right? All it's doing is it's figuring out how to predict the next word based on the surrounding words, right? It's figuring out what are related things to this thing that you said. And so that's still a relatively complex task. It's huge, it requires, mm -hmm. you know, there are a lot of words, there's a lot of things going to it, but it still is like a focused prediction. And so I think things like that are, like you would need so many inputs, you would need so many things, and you would have to remove any guardrails. And I think that's just too far removed from what we're actually seeing, right? Like, I don't think that we're in a different spot now than we were five, 10 years ago on that, right? But we're much better at making documents and having cars that drive themselves. What about the faultiness behind that? So like, for example, like cars, right? A lot of Teslas, you know, fucking went bad shit crazy and just stopped yeah. and created all these different accidents. And some of them accelerated and just went off the rails. So um, is that necessarily something that AI missed the beat or is more of a faulty situation to other types of like, you know, the logistic part of it? Yeah. So I, I think in those situations, so there's something I'll say, like there's a, there's a point that people make, which I do think is valid, but I'll just say it to kind of talk about the second part. But I think that point is like, some people would say, well, it may create accidents, but like people make equally as many accidents or worse, right? And so, you know, that may be true, I'm not, but like, even if you were to think about the second part, like sometimes where these accidents happen is like where you get into scenarios that it doesn't know what to do with it, and it doesn't know how to deal with it, or it has some kind of like, fault or it goes something. And I think those are like normal, normal problems, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why, um, that's one of the reasons why I think, for example, you're still gonna need people to work with contracts because it's not gonna get rid of all the stuff, but you, but if it can simplify your job so you can focus on that, then maybe, you know, you can still catch the errors, but it can do the heavy lifting on some of these things. And so I think that like, you don't necessarily want a human never to look at the stuff, but you actually want kind of a balance of both. 
right? That's my that's my take. Well, in a sense, it kind of creates more work for the human. Yeah, sometimes. Because if I'm if I'm simplifying and like you said, if I can take on more because someone else is sharing a responsibility, that's that's more. That's more for me to do. Yeah. Oh, that's not cool. I think yeah. it's like the repetitive part. Yeah, is probably like the, the, the efficient yeah. part of it. Like, like, you know, if you, like, say, for instance, for what you do on a daily basis, if you're handling, like, 15 customers on average, or clients, I mean, uh, now with AI, I expect you to do 30. You know what I'm saying? It's just like, man. So it's, it's, it's a double-edged sword. I want to say. Oh, yeah. So I think that, in general, is a separate problem, which is that people could just expect more of you, right? They're like, oh, well, you're not doing it. Now it's going to be, you know, do more, right? Or I need to hire less people, but we have more work. It's cool. Use the AI. So I think that's right. a problem. Yeah. yeah that, but that's like a separate issue. That's like. <laughs> that's what more. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, yes. Um, okay. So we're in a world of NFTs and. Mm-hmm digital currency and things like that and you know we have people of, of a certain age you know mm-hmm. they're unfamiliar with technology in itself but you know they're still among us they're still here in our society mm-hmm. and they're productive members um and like we were talking before we started is this you know most i would say i fear what i don't understand you mm-hmm. know if i wake up in the middle of the night and I see a shadow in my room, you know what I'm saying? I'm grabbing my pillow and mm. saying my prayers because I don't know what it is. I don't understand it. Um, is this something you would encourage, like, if there are some kind of community organizations that help, you know, maybe bridge that gap? Like, dude, like, it's okay. Yeah. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Should we, you encourage the acceptance? and? The I mean, I, I think, yeah, so I think it's hard to imagine these things going away. Right, it's hard to imagine that people will be like, "No, we don't want AI to exist," and then it doesn't exist. Like I don't. So, in some sense, it's going to be around. I would definitely encourage people to kind of um, get exposed to it, and especially if you're not. But I think also getting to like figure out what it is that the thing is doing, right? Getting use it. So, like when people are talking about you know large language models and how they use it, um, what I think is scary is that people are like, "Oh, look at this text it's generating." It's you know, it's thinking all these things and it's doing all these things, but it's not thinking them, right? It's just kind of pretty. And so I think somehow peeling back the layers and help showing people how some of these things work would sometimes be helpful to get them on board and be like, okay, I get it. It's making this thing easier, right? Um, and there's a lot of that. Like, I'll give you some examples that just, you know, in ways that some of these things have, have made life better. Do you remember um, like 10 years ago when translators used to suck? So you oh, try to yeah, like yeah, find yeah. something and yeah. it just like, it wouldn't work. So um, you know, that was a problem because like you, if you were traveling and didn't speak the language, it would be hard. Then, you know, you'd go to a place where they use a different alphabet and like, how do I, how do I do this? Right. How do I translate it? Um, then like you couldn't speak to me in a different language and I would, you know, record it. Then, you know, if we were trying to transact online and I was trying to sell you something on eBay, like it wouldn't work. And so a bunch of these tools have come in place that are based on basically these technologies that have made that a lot better and a lot easier. Right. Um, and so, you know, if we understand what it's what is behind it, it's not scary. It's just like helping improve our lives. And I think for some of these people, it can be a huge life improvement. Um, in a similar way, they, they did this study where they looked at like what happened in eBay when they introduced that. So they introduced this feature to help you translate. And all of a sudden, people from countries that couldn't translate, you know what I mean? Like you, you're selling me something from here, but I don't speak English. How am I going to communicate with you? Well, now, if there's a built in translator within eBay, I make that transaction more easily. And all of a sudden, at least so things like that have improved for all for all kinds of people. Right. And I think, um, you know, I think there's definitely ways that it can. I think for some of those people can make the biggest life improvement. But I think it's just kind of showing them what it is and what it's doing and that it's not something particularly scary. But how do you teach that to like Sleepy Joe? I mean, (laughs) like, how do you do that? Like, you know, what I mean, especially like, I mean, they survived COVID. You know what I mean, like now it's like it's going to be a tough situation, you know, especially because, um, like you say, it's all about really improving that repetitive, uh, work that, you know, can definitely, um, give you more time because time is money. Right. Um, so I have a question. So, um, as far as like, do you think AI can learn values? Um, you mean like our values, like what we, yes. Okay. Um, I don't think that that means anything to it. 
but I think you could kind of teach it what people would consider to be right from wrong. Okay. If that makes sense. Um, and I think that's really important. And I think this goes the same way of like privacy. If we consider certain content inappropriate or something like that, we can use it and say like, look, this is what we consider inappropriate and either filter it or deal with it or prevent it or flag it or do something. Right. And so I think that that's something that, you know, it's not going to figure out by itself, but I think that's something that you can actually use it for in a big way. I don't think it means anything to it. Right. It's not like it, it it's going to cry or something. Exactly. Like. Yeah. It's not going to be like, well, I don't think it's wrong, but it's like, yeah. It's not going to be depressed on you. Yeah. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're, Damn. You need a mental health day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so just like a funny anecdote. So this, I, you know, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but it was like meaning that this was their story. I don't know whether it's true or not, whether you agree or not. But um, one of the things that Facebook was saying was, you know, they used to pay a lot of people to sit there and like have to go through content to see if there was like anything inappropriate. And those people obviously have the most horrible job because like what you're doing is showing them the most horrible things on the internet <laughs> and like getting them to like say, you know, yes, yeah, it's okay Give us a not. stamp of approval. And so, yeah, and so like these people obviously, you know, were not, were not thrilled with their day jobs. Um, and so by, by using some type of AI, they could filter out, like they would know, okay, this is bad and like here's where we need a human intervene. But they were saying like, look, this is really reducing the burden on these people that are like, you know, they, like the machine doesn't have, like doesn't respond to it. It doesn't get sad, as you said, right? Whereas like this would be more, yeah, so. Damn. All right. Um, I, I, I'm speaking with a colleague of yours, mm -hmm. Professor Nan, another USC mm -hmm. Marshall Business School. Uh, um, you guys, uh, she mentioned that you guys authored, co-authors. You want to talk about what, what you guys uh, yeah, so, worked on? Yeah, um, so well, what we did was we, we I mean, she has a, an, she is, she's a prolific author. She's published many things on, on AI. The one thing that we've worked on together particularly looks at kind of which companies are developing AI technologies, meaning which companies have patented AI technologies. Um, and so we try to understand kind of who's developing this and where is it coming from. Um, and, and that was interesting in and of itself because I think, um, so we looked at the US and within China. And so within the US, you have big tech companies, you also have some universities, but primarily large tech companies kind of hold the majority of those of those innovations. And that's part of what we part of what we looked at and part of what we show where it's coming from. Um, what was interesting in China was that it was very much university driven, so like publicly funded universities, but there were also a case of like three big tech companies in China that were doing a lot of this stuff. And so it was interesting to know like in some sense who are the leaders, because I think one of the things that's coming up in this that where I think, you know, I'm not scared of all these other things where we're saying, hey, is it going to take our jobs and do this or that? That doesn't really freak me out. The thing that maybe I think we should think more about is like how accessible is this to everybody, right? So these companies decide to jack up the price, then what happens, right? And can this stuff be made more widely available? Can it be that like we have multiple versions of this or that, you know, you have the one that's safe on privacy and you have to pay a ton of money for that. Right. And you have the one that's doing. So I think that that's the thing I, you know, think about more like, you know, if this is being developed in a handful of companies, how should we think about that? If it's being developed um, within a handful of companies, but it's somehow made to be available. And that's one of the reasons I was saying about that company hugging face. Like one of the things I think, <clears throat> excuse me, it's really cool about them is they provide a way for you to download it to your machine. So you can, they have some model, they release something, you can download it and you can use it, right? And so I think that there's like interesting things that are happening there, but I think that's something we should be aware of. Um, and that came from our research. And do you, do you uh, based off of your research or just your own just personal opinion, mm -hmm. uh, should it be something that the price point shouldn't be like the new, uh, what is the new Apple lenses they're coming yeah, out yeah. with? That's like three like Gs. 3500. Yeah. So yeah. What, what is your opinion on should we in order to keep things fair, you know what I'm saying? Because there's always a gap. Everybody's trying to bridge this gap, whether it's opportunity or culture or yeah, whatever yeah. it is. What, so what's your opinion? I think in general, to be fair, I think that a lot of the stuff that we're getting now is like, you know, free. So if you think about most software, right? A lot of stuff we get from Google, a lot of stuff we get online, like it's basically free. Again, think back, you know, 20 years ago, people used to have to go buy software in like a box. Right, and then like you go to Best Buy or whatever, you'd buy a box. It has something that would be expensive, and that would be like your email client, 
right? right? And now you get those things for free, basically, on your devices, and like including a lot of things. So like, we pay for very little software, we actually get a lot free, um, and there's entire business models built around that. So I think, in, so, in general, the price for a lot of these things is lower, and I would say that's been the same for things like ChatGPT, right? Like, it's basically free for kind of not serious usage, relatively cheap for pretty serious usage. And then if you're like using a company level, it's still relatively cheap. It's like, you know, 0 0.020, like 0 0.0002 cents per prompt or something, right? So it's like, it's not particularly expensive, right? But I think that's just something to think about if all these questions are coming up around privacy and all these things about having, you know, is there a sufficient market for that? Do we have enough companies that are, you know, creating stuff that are privacy aware and that there's competition in that market? Is that the same for medical? Is that the same for all those things, right? Um, I, I could be wrong, but my, you know, what I'd anticipate happening is that we'll see, you know, we'll see some companies that specialize and say, look, we can help do a bunch of things in the medical industry, but that's got to be compliant with all these healthcare laws. That's going to be compliant with all these things. And so we're going to specialize in that. And so you usually want to have a co couple companies doing that. Otherwise, the price is going to be really high, right? And so that would be kind of my way of thinking about some of these things. Okay. In your opinion, what would be the ideal, um, uh, pretty much the ideal situation that you that you think would probably be, you know, very useful in the AI industry at this point? Um, I think if we have a lot of companies that start taking this technology and start creating stuff for different, you know, different domains and different markets, I think we'll be in a really good spot, right? I think we'll have a whole bunch of. It's the same as you think about your phone or you think about apps. Like there are all these things that you could do that used to be a hassle that are now really easy. You could imagine the same thing happening. Like it just solves a bunch of problems and different people go after different things and it works. I think that for me would be the most ideal. Like we could get improvement in education, we could get improvement in you know healthcare, we can improve in all these things. And I think that would be for me the best case scenario. Like people start using this and like, cool, but I can use it to solve this problem over here and I can go use it to solve that problem over there. But as far as like, the main component here is electricity, right? Mm -hmm. So now we, we have all these different natural disasters. So how, how can we rely on this so much, but then have that factor? To oh take yeah, yeah. So it depends on like the thing being able to run, right? So if you know if we need people, like you know, if if you need reliable electricity, reliable internet connection, all these other things for this to work, it's great. But then you have to rely on that. And so that if you don't have it, then it's a problem. Yeah. So it comes with its own so, limitation. Well, that's what I'm saying. So that like the fact that we can rely on it so heavily um, coming into the next, you know, these pretty much this past couple of years that we've seen this progress, like obviously at some point there's going to be some sort of uh, natural disaster that can affect that. So do you think that that could lead to something that is not so effective in the long run or you think eventually it's going to reach to that point where it's going to be sustainable oh so I, I think so let me give you an example maybe this is what you mean so like there was a um if you remember a few years ago like amazon's web servers went down right aws and basically like netflix went down disney like all these other things went yeah. down because everything was so based on that right and it was like a morning, but people were freaking out because like you couldn't access your bank and you couldn't do all this. So I think there's like a risk that sometimes some of these things could be so critical to like infrastructure that all of a sudden you don't have a way to do it, right? You're processing something and like all of a sudden this doesn't happen. Um, and that's, I think, something to be aware of. Um, yeah, I don't know how much it would happen. Like I said, I think the thing that I'm, why, one of the reasons why I'm excited about this is I see it kind of, making improvements but making improvements and things that have you know like paperwork that have so far not been particularly fun but allows us to do more um if it goes into all these other areas then you could imagine a problem right like imagine if we had self-driving cars that someone relied on central system and then that central system went down and now we have a bunch of cars stuck that can't move <laughs> right so like you know you'd want to think about things like that but i think those are really kind of like rare cases right um and i think some of the stuff is also you know Sometimes, like, it's the same thing I was talking about with your, your company and how they figured out privacy, how they figured out some of these things. So, you know, sometimes they say, okay, we want to rely on this other company. Sometimes they say, no, no, we want to rely on it ourselves. And therefore, you know, we're going to we're gonna buy this thing from you, but we're going to have it on our own system. And we're going to do it ourselves and things like that. So, you know, sometimes people can protect themselves. It's not, yeah. 
Now, I, you you wear multiple hats, right? Mm -hmm. So let's let's flip the coin again, mm -hmm. right? From an educator's mm -hmm. um, uh, viewpoint, what is your opinion on it as far as how it affects your students? Because in my understanding, like you know, your students when they once they leave school and graduate and go out into the workforce, they're expected to be able to understand and utilize uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, while they are a student, you can use it to kind of cheat get around and cheat on yeah. your work. Um, so I think this is like the debate that everybody is scared of, right? Everybody's like, how are we going to stop this? It's about cheating. This happens in like 90% of faculty conversations. Like, what about cheating, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm less worried about that. I think what it does is it gets rid of like busy work. So if I asked you to just to make sure you did something, I asked you like write a report on this thing, right? And that used to be a way to guarantee that you would have to read a thing and, and write something about it. And now that now I no longer have that. Okay. So, but that means that like, you know, yes, it's gonna affect education because education needs to get better. But I don't think that it, like, it's getting rid of things that weren't particularly good. It's not getting rid of, like, education as a whole. It's just getting rid of, like, busy work in education. That's my opinion on that part. Um, I also think it allows you to learn in new ways, right? So I'm really excited to use this for something like coding. Because coding, I don't know if, I, do either of you code? I've tried it, uh, failed horribly. Okay. So uh, maybe i got to revisit that. Yeah, so if you do revisit it, I would tell you to start with something like ChatGPT and start trying to play around with something like that. Because... Here's, here's the, the way coding works. So you start a class, you pick up a book, you pick up an example, you can copy it, it can work, right? Or it doesn't work and you have no idea why it doesn't work because it looks right, right? In coding, you have to get it exact or it doesn't, it doesn't work. So you're like copying it, you miss a comma, it doesn't work, you don't know how to solve it. Okay, then what do you do? Well, you can go back to the book or you can try something new and like maybe it works, maybe it doesn't and if you're persistent enough it works. You can also go on the internet and ask somebody like, oh, how do I solve this problem? And if you've ever seen like toxic forums, these ones where people talk about coding are the worst. Like people go on and they post the question like, I don't know how to solve this problem. People are just like, well, that's stupid. You're an idiot, get out of here, <laughs> right? So like you don't get that, like it's not, you know, it's not a super warm and fuzzy, hey, tell me tell me all the like, yeah, silly questions yeah. you have. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's that's kind of one of the things that schools were doing were helping you get to a minimum level where you could move forward. Um, one of the things that I think is great about this is that you can start writing some code, or even if like you don't know how to write code, you're like, how would I write code to do this? And it'll give you an example. And you can go take your code, you can give it to something like ChatGPT and it can help you fix it. And so that process can help you learn a lot more than kind of the old way, right? So I'm more enthusiastic that people will actually get better with coding and learn from things like this and overcome what used to be like a tricky part of it. Um, and then like, yeah, of course, you know, I could do the assignment with that instead of doing it, but I don't think that's necessarily, yeah, I, I think that there's more, like if you don't want to learn, yes. But I think if you do want to learn, it actually opens the door a lot more than it than it harms you. And, and, and you know, that's the tricky part because Think about like when you go and you, you talk to a surgeon, right? Mm -hmm. Like like he could have passed with C's, right? He yeah. could have passed with, you know, a, a very low grade, um, but here he is doing a heart transplant. So like that's kind of like mind blowing because uh, I mean, he he was genuinely dumb, you know what I mean? But, but then he obviously can it, it, like, <coughs> basically perform at a at a way where he can get the job done so uh, what are your thoughts on on obviously having this shortcut and then especially like in the medical field like uh, what are your I mean I don't think it's gonna teach people how to be surgeons um, it can help you learn how to do better on an exam and help you figure out how to do stuff more easily it could help you maybe retrieve information more easily and things like so that. So the C students are now going to be like, you know, the, 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 let's just talk about the F student. You're not even a surgeon if you're F. No, 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 no. But the, but the oh, F student, the his, his actual intelligence, I'm talking about his actual intelligence, like he's dumb as shit, but now he's a C student because he has that, access yeah yeah but I, I think that there's still there's still but the b student's going to become uh, the c student's going to become a b student and then like they're still not going to let him become a net right you still need a certain number of those people 
So it's you're still going to get picked based on where you are in the distribution. So the F guy could move up, the B guy could move up, the A guy moves up, and so you still end up with the same surgeon. Damn. Shit. So it's kind of scary. <laughs> but you're worried about that, dude. I always tell people all the time, and they don't believe me. Like, maybe I just have their own doctors. But when I go to the doctor, my doctor be on Google. Yeah, they you do. Know what they I'm do. <laughs> like, ask Jeeves. Like, what? Are you serious? <laughs> like, what are we doing here? And then, like, when I notice, they try to turn the computer screen. Yeah. Like, so I can't, like, dude, I see you on Google. <laughs> like, what are we doing here? Yeah. But That's um, not a doctor. That's a drug dealer. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah, pretty much. And, and that... And that's another topic, but that that's pretty much what we're dealing with right now. That's the easiest thing to do, but we're not even here to talk about that. All right, but look, what I do want to talk about is uh, what t when I was talking to Professor Nan, uh, she was telling me that Chat GPT four mm -hmm. passed the bar, right? Mm -hmm. So Kim K, look out, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. <laughs> but what the uh, what the issue is 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 that human factor. Mm -hmm. Like you can have chat BT, you can pass the bar, but that doesn't mean necessarily can represent you on good and well mm -hmm. in a trial defense or whatever mm -hmm. the case may be. Um, is that something we can possibly see in a in the future? Is our, our legal representation be artificial intelligence? So. so I think that if you think about how much time, like, like if you think about a lawyer's job, I think standing in front of a judge is the like smallest part of that, right? A lot of it is like paperwork and things like that and filing things. A lot of that is preparing that paperwork and filing and doing those things, right? So I can see it at various points throughout that process, helping you find case law, helping you organize things, helping you, you know, make sure that what you're, you know, what you're saying doesn't have something else that like, you know, is related that you haven't thought about. So I can see it doing all of those things that make a lawyer more effective. Um, that make a lawyer, you know, maybe better prepared or things like that, but I don't see it necessarily now it's going to represent you and now you're going to pay a thing to represent you. I can imagine you saying, look, I have to file, you know, I want to challenge somebody in court. I want to say, can you help me generate the paperwork, right? Provide a summary of what happened. Okay, here's whatever you need to file. Here's where you're going to do it, how you do it. I can see that happening. But I don't see it becoming like a full-blown lawyer that's doing all these things. It would be better than a public defender. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Not, not, not that I would know. <laughs> no, 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 right? Wouldn't it? Well, I mean, again, not that I would know, but I, I have a feeling that, like, <laughs> you could use it, you know, sometimes that, imagine that, like, you know, you show up with a public defender and a public defender is going to tell you one view of the situation. This could be like a Google, right? So, like, you know, if, if I go to Google and I'm like, well, what do I do in this particular case? It might not be able to answer that question. But if I go to a, a well-developed kind of large language model and I say, hey, I have this legal situation, what is, give me some information about it, give me typical sense, give me whatever, it can probably provide you with more information. You could probably ask it more questions than you could a public defender, right? So I think you could imagine something like that. Do you have any uh, passion projects that you're personally working on? Um, Maybe something in the garage? Related to this, so yeah. one thing that I'm interested very much around this education side of it, so like this thing that I said with coding, like this has been my own kind of experience, and I got really excited. So the other thing to do with coding, like when you get used to coding, like you get used to doing stuff, right? You don't necessarily remember how it goes, but you know how to look it up, okay? So then you go to this thing called documentation, which is like an encyclopedia. For, so if you're using Python, which I often use, and then like you're using some package that's doing something in there. So you're using like, I don't know, you know, pandas or sklearn or something. So these are all packages that either work with data or do some kind of machine learning on Python, okay? So you need to remember how the some pa command works. You're obviously not gonna remember, you go look it up. When you've never done that before, it is terrifying. Like when you show this to a student, it is the scariest looking website possible, right? Like I can show you later, it just looks, intimidating but when you know what you're doing I look at that and in three seconds I find the answer that I need when I show that to my students that are learning coding for the first time they're like I they're like you're telling me the answer is on here I'm gonna quit and go home and cry right and so then having that as like a transition where you can say okay I'm gonna teach you how to code but I'm actually have you like interact with this thing and help help you along the way and I'm trying to kind of get that so what I told you before is like my hypothesis that I could actually help people learn and so one of the things that we're thinking about is could we do something that actually help people learn how to code better using this tool rather than it being a scary thing, right? And not in a way that it's going to like
do anything other than help you find resources, right? So the documentation also doesn't, it gives you the answer when you know what you're doing. You know, you have that right now, it's a book this thick or it's a website. What it's gonna do is it's gonna give you that in five seconds and you don't have to look it up and it's gonna present in a friendlier way. And this can help you learn and hopefully, you know, next time you try to learn how to code, it's not gonna scare you away. Now, with that, since, since it's like, you know, STEM, STEM related, um, is that something you think should be pushed more in our society? Because, you know, I mean, just being honest, like, mm -hmm. I, I remember when I was trying to decide on what I wanted to do when I wanted anything away from math, math mm -hmm. and, and STEM, I was just like, oh my gosh, dude, like, it's cool to be challenged, but be challenged all the time, like, mm -hmm. for four years straight, you know, trying to figure this out. Um, do you think that's stem in itself should just be pushed more in, in our culture and our society um you mean stem education independently yeah, of AI. Independently. so i think that there are elements of stem that are made to be intimidating that they don't need to and i think if you made them less intimidating i think a lot of people would be a lot more on board with stuff right they'd be like oh okay i get it that this isn't some you know confusing abstract thing or at least i can get an outline of how it works so I think part of it is that, you know, I think STEM is important. I mean, I, you know, I can't, I, it would be hypocritical of me to say it's not given what I do, but I think at the same time, like I can see why a lot of people are put off by some of these things. And I think if you're put off by it, then it kind of dissuades you from going further into it, right? And that's what I think about something like coding. Like I think if you can overcome that first level of, oh my God, this is so difficult, then like, you kind of so I have a, I don't have a lot of sympathy for the people that are like STEM and trying to make non-STEM people feel bad because they don't they're like they're not that smart they just kind of want to make you know what I mean they've right. just gone that extra step right. and they've figured it out and they can like be like oh how do you not know this so when you learn coding like when you overcome that and you're like oh I get how it works and I know how to do it then all of a sudden you're like oh okay I can actually like give me a new language, I don't know how to do it, but I'm sure I could figure it out because I know kind of how it works and I know that I can do it. Give me a new problem. Maybe I don't know exactly how to figure it out, but I kind of know how to get there and maybe who to talk to and how to you know how to move forward with it at least. So I think that's, that's my approach to a lot of these STEM things. Like I definitely think it's important, but I think it's not just about like everybody should learn it. I think everybody should learn something about it. Now, I think I was, I was reading something. I don't know if it's true, man. You know, there's a lot of things floating around on the internet, but as far as like, Humanoids, right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to break this down for me. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they say like, what's it? Was your boy from Tesla? Was this guy? Was that guy? Elon. Name? They say he got a he got a, a girlfriend, right? That's that's a humanoid, right? Uh, and when I think of humanoids, I I think of I don't know if you ever seen the movie. I, I, I put it in our, our little notes there, but Weird Science. Mm -hmm. Weird Science is a movie dated way back, way back when. Like the 80s about some, or something. Yeah, unpopular high school kids create the perfect woman, but she's an AI. Right? Um, do you think, or can you see that? Because you know, I think about children and video games, the relationships they have with these with these consoles. It's like they're so involved and so into in tech in general. Phones, mm -hmm. like you sit at a dinner table and everybody's just, you know. And mm -hmm. now, if now I can create something that's not going to argue with me. She's gonna be supportive. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know, could it eventually, you know, replace? Uh, that human experience, you know, uh, you can't procreate, <laughs> but that may be a good thing for some people. You know what I'm saying? Like, you ain't gonna get pregnant, right? You know, but like, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so I think one of the things that's funny um, is that, and like you said, when I saw the notes, it made me think of it. It's like if you look, there's been a bunch of these companies that show up, and they're like, oh, AI friend, AI girl, this is like kind of robot that you talk to online. <laughs> um, and I think that that's like the start of that where like they're trying to figure, you know what I mean? They're trying to say like, okay, well, you know, maybe some people just want to talk to somebody and here's this robot that's not going to argue with you. It's going to tell you how you're great all the time and that's all it's going to do, right? Um, and so I could imagine that happening in some sense and I would even, you know, I could even imagine something happening where you have, you know, some kind of companies that emerge where like this is their specialty. So it's not only that you're playing like a video game, but it's somehow interacts with you or caters to you or customizes to you and then that connection becomes even stronger so i can imagine all that but i don't necessarily I, I mean i don't know maybe i'll be completely wrong <laughs> i don't, <laughs> I don't think they're things. gonna do an intelligent vagina you know what i mean like i don't, <laughs> think, I don't, think, I don't think it's gonna get to that point yeah like 
No, but I think it's no, bro. It's it's okay. Well, you you already have stuff like that that kind of exists, but without the intelligence. You get what I'm saying? Like they have that. That's Judas right there. Yeah, 100%. no, they have that. That exists, bro. Like, but now you add the AI factor into it. It's I mean it was a uh, it was a series that came out on I believe CBS, NBC, maybe a year or two ago where. That's what happened. They they had like green eyes or blue eyes or something like that. I think Halle Berry was in it or something. But they were, you couldn't tell the difference whether it was human or not. Almost like like now. What if it? What if this is impl- implemented in religion? Imagine mm-hmm. like like th- like you say like obviously you could see a whole book right and you can get it in five seconds. So imagine the impact that it could make, right? Like you don't have to read. Uh, the daily verse you you see it all in one and then you get a now summary of what you need to right so a cliff note bible not even that's not even a cliff note i think that's more of a it it, it generates a bunch of data that obviously has been for you know so let, got, me, let me give a scenario whether this is what you're saying so instead of like reading the bible i could have some kind of algorithm that understands this and then i could ask it questions and it's telling me what to do right and so now I'm like getting divine inspiration, but I'm getting it from a robot through my phone. But in reality, it's like portrayed as because it's coming from something I'm getting. You know, it sounds serious, right? Is it like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, because now you have. But we already do that. No, 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 if no, think about no. It, but if you really think about it, you online. have, you have, you have the Bible, you have the Quran, you have the Torah, you have all these different. So now imagine everything being simplified into one simple answer. Yeah. Right. I, I, wouldn't so that could, make an impact? But didn't you say it don't it it doesn't create anything new? It just creates what is existing, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I think that's that's what I was trying to ask. Like, it's the idea. Your idea being that, like, okay, we've had these things like religion that have been relatively static in the sense that you're always pointing back to some document, right? That's right. Relatively right. static, but now you have this thing that's going to do interpretations or it's going to do whatever is that right kind of right, right yeah. yeah so it's like you have this additional layer in between and maybe and i think you know i kind of agree with you also that like yeah some of this has maybe been around in different ways in the past right there's been something there's not there's often been like an intermediary in some sense but um, the emotion behind it though isn't that a huge impact as far as the way it's translating but ai can't be emotional Exactly. So now it's giving you a simplicity of what that book means. But I think it can simulate emotions. So this is where I think people are getting tricked. They're getting it's like it can simulate emotions. Like you know that New York Times article where like the robot told the guy to leave his wife. I keep saying robot. The the large language model told the guy to leave his wife. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I, think, so. I think I heard a little so, bit about so it. So it was like in this you know this news reporter got access to it and then he was like playing around with it, and then like it got into some conversation where like the robot was asking it to leave its wife. And they published the like dialogue on the front page of New York Times, and it was, like caused a big stir. Um, but it, you know, it's in some sense predicting kind of based on text that it has what the thing will look. So some of it will sound emotional. It'll sound, you know, it'll pull from a romance novel. It'll pull from somewhere. It'll sound emotional, but it's not actually. And some some people need that, right? Some some people are looking for that in terms of like some kind of, you know, touch. What, what, yeah, exactly. Like they want to talk to somebody that you know has some emotional response. And I think that's what was missing in the past, right? That was missing from um, some of these tools in the past that now is getting easier, but like, who knows? Maybe a bunch of other things are gonna get, you know, a bunch of other things are gonna happen that I can't foresee, that we can't foresee. But could AI girlfriends be a thing? <laughs> you know, like, like I mean, that's what like I'm saying. So in, I, think, walk in, I don't know sit, if anybody's gonna sit. walk in. So that, that you, need a, you need a whole bunch of other technology, but I definitely, I definitely think somebody's gonna sell something that's like an AI girl. Just like I'm saying, it probably is online right now. Um, I think some version of that exists. Somebody will text you like this, your girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, damn. Oh, I mean, no, I just what, what was the, man? What was that movie that just came out, man, with the the little robot the, and she started killing everybody? Ah, oh, dang. I can't think of it right now, but that's like I, in my opinion, when I when I look at movies, uh, whether it's involving technology or not, if it's introduced in the movie, I think like either it's it's in a it's development stage or it's already full running. Oh, hundred percent! Like it, 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 like it makes you like kind of feel okay 
that this is what's gonna happen. Yeah, like we're know? introducing it to you now to kind of soften the blow, but yeah, it's it's coming. But I forget the movie. But so, yeah, the girl needed a friend. The young girl needed a best friend. The AI robot model humanoid came in and replaced that. And because she be developed so much emotions for the young girl, she protected her by killing any man oh, who okay. came close. Yeah, it's an interesting movie. But yeah, that's why I was like, man, like, dude, like, it looks so real. Like, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference, obviously, because it's a human actor. But, yeah. you know what I'm saying? You wouldn't, what if we get to that point? You know, that's what I'm like, man, dude. Like, we already don't communicate and socialize that much like we used to in the past because you're entertained and your thoughts are with your your, your smartphone. Or you, you can't else. bribe a robot, you know what I mean? So that makes sense if that's if But that's not what if it's saying. coded, like if it's yeah. coded to be human, it it can make the same mistakes that you make. It, it wouldn't be like bribe. Like you can't say, hey, I'm going to give you X amount of money. Like what is he going to do? You know what I mean? He doesn't have emotions. But or, if you code that into it, that's weird. Whatever. Yeah, he, he's uh, the expert. Uh, okay. But uh, I got one question one, uh, just off the top. Uh, if there was one thing you can take away from mankind, what would it be and why? You mean traits of people or yeah. just like one thing in society? One thing in society. Um, I don't know about that. It's That's a hard question for me to answer because I feel like whatever, you know, whatever things that are doing something bad are also doing something good. And so it's really hard to it's really hard to think about what you could get rid of without any kind of trade-offs. That'd be my, I don't know if you guys have a different answer, but yeah, I think that makes that makes it hard for me to like pick one thing. Yeah, no, that's a great answer because it's always a trade-off. Yeah. Like do, you, do you see things more on a logical standpoint? Is that what it is? Um, yeah, I mean, I try to. I don't know whether I'm always that way, but I try to, right? Because I think that like, you know, if I think about, um, whatever right so you're thinking about smartphones and so like we're all addicted we're not socializing all these things that are annoying at the same time you know it's easier to go to places and travel places and it's easier to do everything it's it enables a bunch of people that are like you know what i mean like if you think about some some older people how hard it is to do certain things with them and like how you know it's again i have an i have an aunt who like you know, it was I remember um, her going to visit or try to talk to her granddaughter and she was like waiting for me to show up so they could like Skype because they didn't have the, the technology. Right. And like things like that are now easier than ever. Right. And so like there's good and there's bad and it's hard to it's hard to say, oh, let's just remove this thing. I think a lot of things could be made better. Or, like we should be more conscious about what they do. We should. You know, I think my one thing that I would definitely change is like, you know, it would be helpful if we put our kind of efforts more towards so like if you think about education and AI let's let's talk about like how students can cheat because now you know the genie's out of the bottle they can cheat more like okay what can we teach them that's more useful and like instead of de dedicating 80% of our effort to that let's dedicate you know more effort to stop them you know, no not to <laughs> stop them to find <laughs> ways to yeah. teach them oh, new okay. how to learn from learning this, right? oh. um, so I think things like that like that's that's one thing I change maybe where we allocate effort on some things okay right. Hey, well, this has been an amazing and great uh, conversation. Um, but as we're coming to the conclusion of our show, um, as I always do, I'll open up the microphone, the table, to our guests and to our hosts to share any parting words or whatever with our listeners and viewers. Today, we're going to start off with our guest, Professor Milan. Is there anything you would like to leave our listeners and viewers with? Um, well, I mean, first, thanks for having me. Um, second, I think, you know, my, my take on a lot of these things is, a lot of this technology is sometimes portrayed as being scary, and some of the things are scary, fair enough. But I think there's also a lot of potential, um, and I think you know people shouldn't be necessarily as scared of it as much as curious and trying to engage with it. And often, at least my own kind of advice would be, rather than trying to go off and like read a, what a bunch of people on Twitter are going to say, which is often you know you're going to get the most polarizing opinions. I don't know if you're going to learn much from it. Um, you know, sometimes just go and try to learn figure out how this stuff works yourself and i think when you start doing that you'll figure out like you know i'll still go use the solution that somebody else creates right i'll still use chat gpt i'm not going to make my own version of it but if i can play around and understand how the pieces are then i can learn a lot and feel a lot more confident about it so i'd suggest something like that like be less intimidated think more about how you can kind of start working with stuff yourself and i think that makes you more confident and more likely to engage nice gq nesto I want to say um, 
let's embrace change. And um, if there's one thing that is very valuable to any human being in this world is time. So let's embrace this change to save time and, you know, uh, get to our uh, objectives a lot quicker, a lot more effective and, you know, uh, focus more on living versus, you know, struggling. Um, and I'm um, Drew. Um, I would say to um, understand and develop an understanding. You know what I'm saying? Like like the professor was saying, instead of looking at something and even though it appears to be complicated, if it was created by man, it has to be simple in some kind of way. It's just developing an understanding to be able to comprehend and see what you're actually looking at. But we thank you for tuning in. Please follow us on all our social media handles option for it on everything. I'm Drew. We're option for it. We see you guys next time. God bless. Peace.